Well, good morning and welcome to Marine View Church Online. My name is Jesse Skiffington and I serve as pastor here at Marine View. I want to welcome you today as we uh, get to hear from a guest speaker this morning, continuing in our January message series in the Gospel of Matthew. So without further ado, here is our very own Andrew Johnson. The song that we have paired the sermon with for fun this week is Paul McCartney's The Long and Winding Road. Hopefully you won't leave this morning thinking that this sermon was a long and winding road. But I suppose one benefit of watching this online is that you can fast forward if you want to. But before we get further into the sermon, let's pause to do this week's memory verse for those of us participating. For those of you who recall this week's reference verse is Matthew 10, 7 through 8. And it goes like this. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received and freely give. Matthew 10, 7 through 8. We'll put that verse up on the screen for those of you who want to see it again. Uh, And now we'll go back into this morning's sermon. Paul McCartney originally wrote The Long and Winding Road at his farm in Scotland in 1968 as the tensions amongst the Beatles were approaching their breaking point. The Long and Winding Road is a beautifully sad song about companionship, broken relationships, and a yearning for reconciliation that doesn't seem possible and yet remains worth hoping for. I'm not going to sing it to you, and you don't want me to sing it to you, But the third and fourth stanzas of the five stanza song read like this. Many times I've been alone, and many times I've cried. Anyway, you'll never know the many ways I've tried. And still, they lead me back to the long, winding road. You left me standing here a long, long time ago. Don't leave me waiting here. Lead me to your door. Life as we know it is a bit of a paradox, interwoven with both beauty and brokenness, love and loneliness, violence and peace, sickness and health. The list of life's paradoxical antitheses could go on and on. This morning, we're going to look at a passage in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus summons his early disciples to go out on the road to carry on his mission, to save the lost and care for the weary. As we will see this morning in today's passage, healing is a central motif of the mission of Christ. Sickness, brokenness, hurt, harm, they all come in various forms and in varying degrees. And not all forms of illness are immediately visible. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus seeks to amplify the good of human experience and remedy the bad by drawing people back into communion with God, who is the source of all life, goodness, joy, and love. A God who addresses us in the everyday, wanting to be known by us, and wanting us to know that we are known. As disciples of Jesus, we are meant to offer glimpses of hope in both word and deed, that weariness need not have the final word, that we are not forgotten, and that we don't have to go it alone because God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, knows, cares, and desires to be in life-giving relationship with us. As Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And as 1 Peter 5, 7 reminds us, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So this morning, as we look closer into the passage from Matthew's gospel this morning, we are going to focus on the nature of the mission that Christ gives to his disciples. Then we're going to think about the implications that this has for disciples of Christ today. But before we do that, 
Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We pray this morning that you would sharpen our minds and soften in our hearts so that we might hear what you have to say in your word to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today's passage in Matthew in chapter 10 verses 1 through 15 comes after Jesus has given the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7 and after Matthew has recorded Jesus performing many miracles in chapters 8 and 9. At the very end of chapter 9, Jesus talks about the harvest of those in need of the gospel is great, but the laborers sharing the gospel are few. And this transitions into Jesus' summoning of his disciples to go out and participate in his mission without him. We notice immediate similarities between Christ's mission and the mission that he gives to the disciples. If we were to look back again in Matthew 9, 35 and 36, we read that Jesus went throughout, through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then when we move forward and look at the first verse in chapter 10, we read that Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. <clears throat> Jesus is tasking the disciples to carry out the mission that he has already begun. And we know theologically that even though the apostles are being told to go away from Christ, that they are not laboring apart from God's provision and power, working through them and alongside them. In verses 2 through 4 of Matthew chapter 10, Matthew lists the names of the 12 apostles. As we read, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus and Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Now the terms apostle and disciple are mostly synonymous, although disciple carries connotations of following and apostle has connotations of being sent out. The two terms are often used interchangeably because there's still much semantic overlap between the two terms as both denote people who are committed to Christ and people who represent Christ to others. As we look at verses 5 and 6 in Matthew chapter 10, we see Jesus begin to give specific instructions to the, to the apostles. As Matthew records, these 12, Jesus, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, based on the Gospel of Matthew as a whole, we can discern that this specific instruction is a time-bound instruction for the apostles right then and there. It's not one that's meant to be universally, universally applicable. How do we know this? We know this because of what the beginning and the end of Matthew's Gospel tell us about the scope of the good news that is realized in and through the person of Jesus Christ. As we learned Earlier in this sermon series this fall, the genealogy of Jesus places Jesus in the line of Abraham. And this implies that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham, that God would bless all people on the earth through him. Then, at the very end of Matthew's gospel, post-crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus commissions the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, as Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So as we begin to think about all these dimensions, 
Why then does Jesus give his apostles specific instructions to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and not to the towns largely populated by Gentiles and Samaritans? Well, as the New Testament scholar R.T. France notes in his commentary on Matthew, he says, Jesus is the Messiah of God's people Israel, coming in fulfillment of Israel's scriptures to save his people from their sins, so it is at first sight not surprising that it is specifically to Israel that his disciples are also sent. As France goes on to further explain, the geographical terms used here in verses 5 and 6 indicate a restriction on the area to be visited rather than a total ban on contact with Gentiles and, Gentiles and Samaritans as such. So here Jesus instructs his apostles to go first to the area where people are expecting the Messiah. To let them know that their expectation has arrived. The apostles are instructed to do this by proclaiming the good news and by demonstrating the power of his reign, by caring for the oppressed and distressed, inviting people back into communion with God through the person of Jesus Christ. As Jesus goes on to say in verse 7, As you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Here Jesus offers a succinct description of what the good news is. As he says, the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is part of what we continually pray for when we pray the Lord's Prayer each week and say, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that God's kingdom would break into our lives more and more each day and we pray for God's kingdom to ultimately come when Jesus returns to establish his rule over the world, where sickness, death, and sin will finally be remedied in full. As Christians, when we reflect theologically on the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, you'll often hear people use the phrase, now and not yet. The kingdom of heaven is here now, but it has not yet been fully established. As Christians, it is our joy to not only be beneficiaries of the coming kingdom of God, but it is our privilege to also be able to participate in God bringing his kingdom into the lives and hearts of those around us through word and deed. God's kingdom is good, and anyone in their right mind should want others to be able to experience his goodness. In line with the fact of this proclamation, that the kingdom of heaven has come near, Jesus gives his apostles some specific instructions on what they ought to do. As Matthew 10, 8 records, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. The disciples are told to remedy illnesses in the name of Christ. They're even told to raise the dead and cast out demons. Now there's some discussion to be had about whether or not all disciples of Christ, even within the early church, were expected to raise the dead or to miraculously heal or to cast out demons like Christ did. However, the fundamental thrust of this call to action is clear. The disciples, through the means and powers given to them, are sent out to remedy sickness and brokenness that is separating people from God, from their true selves, and from life as God intends it to be. As the second portion of John chapter 10, verse 10 reminds us, Jesus has come that we may have life and have it to the full. And this is the th central thrust to be agents of healing and reconciliation as an enduring principle that all Christians are called to embody. As Jesus goes on to say in verses 9 through 15, Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. 
If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. The disciples are sent out to draw people back into the life of God, and they are told to do this without accepting monetary payment. They're not supposed to take money for their services, but neither are they supposed to bring mon supposed to bring money or supplies with them. They are supposed to accept that in their mission to take care of people, that they will in turn encounter some people who are willing to take care of them. These final verses speak about sharing life with people who are receptive to the gospel message and not being discouraged by those who remain obstinate to it. The disciples are told not to dwell with or on those who oppose the mission of Christ. At this point for the apostles, their directive is to focus their time and energy on the people who are receptive to God and trust that God will deal with those who are not. Now, at face value, the condemnation in verse 15 of those who oppose the apostles might appear strikingly harsh. For those of us who know the Old Testament story of Sodom and Gomorrah, it wasn't pretty. But when we think about it in light of what these people are opposing, it begins to make a little more sense. These are people who are either apathetic or openly hostile to the apostles offering restoration refuge and reconciliation to people who have been harassed or helpless or are oppressed by the effects of sin in our world in various ways. As we see throughout the Bible, God is the God of victims and those who humbly recognize their need for him. God is love, but he is also holy. And precisely because God is love, his just wrath is promised to those who remain obstinately opposed to the distribution of his goodness. God is slow to anger, but he's not indifferent to injustice. The good news of the gospel is not that God has decided to apathetically call the bad aspects of human existence good. The good news of the gospel is that the goodness of God has come into the world through the person and work of Jesus Christ to remedy that which plagues us and to pardon us for our culpability in spreading the effects of sin in our actions. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus promised to heal our brokenness, comfort us in our distress, forgive us when we repent, and reform us when we rely on his grace. The disciples were sent out on the road to proclaim the good news of the gospel in word and deed. They were told to heal with the power and the means that they had been given in the name of Jesus Christ. They were told to expect that it would not always be easy but that God would provide for them. Now today, we may not have been given miraculous powers of healing, but as followers of Christ, we have all been given the means and the power to offer glimpses of hope in both word and deed, that weariness need not have the final word, that we are not forgotten, and that we don't have to go it alone, because God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, knows, cares, and desires to be in life-giving relationship with us. And this love in action is a central identity marker of the Christian because it reflects the heart of God. As James 1.27 reminds us, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And as Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world that James refers to is the moral world of corruption in its many facets. We can keep ourselves unstained by the world by avoiding selfish indifference and by taking the time to care for the well-being of those around us. As the historian Alec Ryrie argues in his 2019 book, Unbelievers, An Emotional History of Doubt, 
Historically speaking, the main driving force of the rise in Western atheism has not been intellectual, contrary to what com is commonly assumed, but it has been emotional and ethical. Ryrie argues that the sophisticated philosophical articulations of doubt that arose in Western European culture followed behind the grassroots emotional and ethical dissatisfactions with the church. I suspect that this is still largely true today. Some criticisms of the church are illegitimate, but others unfortunately are legitimate, and they're legitimately aimed at churches and believers who have ceased to live lives of wisdom and grace. As 1 Peter 3.15 reminds us, disciples of Jesus should be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within us. But as 2 Peter 1.5-9 reminds us further, that we should, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Now we do not make these personal efforts at reformation because we are trying to merit our salvation, but because we want to benefit from the goodness of God in our own lives and reflect God's goodness to those around us. As disciples of Christ, it is important for us to gain knowledge but if our lives fail to reflect the life of God and our hearts don't reflect the heart of God, then we shouldn't be surprised if our witness is ineffective and unproductive. Nor should we be surprised if our own faith begins to feel stale or irrelevant. Healing and the hope of transformation, participating in the life of God, these are central to the mission and the promise of the gospel that Jesus Christ makes possible. Sometimes life can feel like a long and winding road. And what we need is not for someone to give us directions, but for someone to come meet us where we are. Jesus promises to meet us where we are, and he promises to open his door. If you have not experienced that life-giving relationship with God through repentance and belief in Jesus Christ, my prayer is that you will. If you have experienced that life-giving relationship with God, through repentance and belief. My prayer is that the joy of your salvation would be renewed and that by God's grace you would be able to reflect the life and love of God to others in such a way that it causes them to question their disbelief in the goodness of God. May we all aspire to be people who reflect the life and love of God to others in such a way that it causes them to question their disbelief in the goodness of God. And may we all experience that life-giving relationship that is offered to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.